Good morning, everyone. Um, and we're now going to move into the public session of our formal meeting today. And I'd like to welcome those people watching and taking part to the 16th meeting in 2019 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask everyone please to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent? Um, this is agenda item two, which is a transport update. Uh, I, I would have to say that uh, we are somewhat later starting, um, which was, uh, I believe, due to traffic problems uh, this morning. Um, but the Cabinet Secretary, no doubt, will update us. But what I would say to committee members before we go into this is I will try and structure the meeting such that we do get onto the broadband uh, issues that some people have raised. Um, but there may be questions that we don't get to, and the Cabinet Secretary, I'm sure, will be happy to acknowledge at the outset that uh, we may ask him to write to those. So with that in mind, I'd like to welcome the panel this morning, uh, Michael Matheson, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity, with Alistair Graham, the Head of Planning and Design, Alison Irvin, uh, the Director of Transport Strategy and Analysis, uh, Chris Wilcott, the Director of Aviation, Maritime Freight and Canals, and Andrew Mackey, the Head of Rail Franchising for the Scottish Government. Um, I think because we're so short on time, Cabinet Secretary, we'll go straight into the uh, questions, if we may. And the first question is going to be from John Finney. John. Yeah, thank you. Good, you know, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and panel. Cabinet Secretary, I have some questions about the delay to the delivery of the, the new ferries. Um, and particularly, can I can I ask if you've received a response to your letter to Ferguson Marine setting out the new programme and the cost of the MV Glen Sanex and Hull 802? And if, if not... When do you expect to have that information, please? Sure. Um, Commissioner, can I just apologise for the delay in arriving this morning? Of course, if there are any outstanding questions that need to be responded to after the session, I'm more than happy for us to provide a written response if that assists the uh, committee. On the uh, question raised by Mr uh, Finney, the uh, Director for uh, Economic Development, the Scottish Government, received a response at the beginning of May. Uh, to request for further information from uh, FMEL on their planned programme. Um, uh, she has since had to go back to them for further details uh, around their uh, time plan uh, for the continued work on both the vessels uh, and also the costs associated with them and is waiting for further details to be provided by FMEL. So an initial response has been provided, but further information has been sought from them. Okay, thank you, Kevin. CML has rejected a, a claim for additional costs from Ferguson Marine. Assuming Ferguson Marine continue to claim these costs, how will the dispute resolution progress? And what, importantly for my constituents, what impact will that have on the delivery of the ferries? Well, the committee will be aware that we have um, uh, appointed someone ind independently in order to look at both sides of the dispute between CML and FML to um, uh, try to provide ministers with uh, an impartial, independent view uh, on the dispute between between both uh, parties. Um, uh, we are, uh, that work will probably take in the region of around four weeks to be complete. Um, uh, process has already started. Um, uh, in terms of any uh, costs which are attributable to um, uh, CMAL, if that was the outcome, uh, then it would have to be through the normal process of loans from the Scottish Government to CMAL. Um, uh, however, at this stage, um, it would be premature for us to say that that's something which is, um, uh, which is a position we're in at the present time, given the independent review that's been undertaken at the present moment. Are you able to express any view on how confident you are about uh, the fixed cost of £97 million being realised? Well, that remains a, it's a fixed price contract uh, for uh, both these vessels. That remains the uh, the sum for their uh, for their construction. Um, uh, but anything uh, over and above that would be one which would have to be um, uh, uh, fully attributable uh, and uh, identifiable as any additional costs which have occurred incurred as a result of actions on the part of CMAL. Uh, that sta this stage we're not at that particular point. Um, the independent review will allow uh, ministers to uh, have an opinion in evaluating both sides of the uh, the dispute in this matter uh, and to then uh, consider coming to a decision on the issue. Um, uh, but if there are any additional costs uh, which uh, taxpayers have to meet uh, through CMAL, it would be through the normal process uh, of how loans are provided to CMAL uh, for construction of vessels. 
Okay, thank you. And were that to be the case, what implications would that have for further ferry investments? Because there's much needed with a, a growing, ageing fleet. And, uh, and then in the longer term, perhaps, if you could come to the with implications for um, what were to be um, improvements in the, the ferry service? Uh, well, at this stage, we're, um, uh, we're not anticipating it having any immediate impact on our uh, ferry procurement programme at the present time, but we'll have to wait to see what the final outcome is of any independent review and whether there are any uh, co additional costs associated with that for uh, for CMAL. Uh, so I don't want to prejudice that and prejudge mm -hmm. that, uh, but that will have to be dealt with at that particular point. Um, it has the potential for having an impact, but at this stage, we've not arrived at that particular point. Um, in relation to uh, impact it has on services, so for example, uh, on the, uh, uh, you know, it's disappointing we're in this position with the, uh, the Glen Sanox and uh, Hull 802 being uh, so delayed. Uh, it means that we are not able to uh, uh, to provide the additional services that we would have wanted to. So, for example, on the uh, on Arne and Campbelltown route, uh, there was the intention of having two vessels throughout the year. Uh, that's not been possible as a result of the delay. Uh, the additional um, uh, vessel 802 being deployed into the uh, into the Outer Hebrides service, um, uh, which is no longer possible at the present time. Uh, uh, so that's been delayed uh, and has an impact. In order to try and help to mitigate some of that, uh, you'll be aware that last uh, August we had the uh, £3.5 million resilience fund, uh, which was provided to uh, to CalMAC to assist them in maintaining their existing vessels to try and help to improve reliability. Uh, and we'll provide a further £4 million uh, in, uh, uh, in this financial year in order to allow that to continue to be supported to try and help to mitigate some of the risks associated with uh, vessels going off uh, service. So it has had an impact on our ability to provide greater resilience in some routes uh, and to enhance services in some routes as well. Thanks. Finally, will, will you undertake to keep the committee updated on developments around the, the, this issue? Please? Of course, yeah. more than happy to do that and to make sure you're kept informed as progress is made. Thank yeah. you. Um, Jamie. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I ask, um, when did you uh, last visit the yard to inspect progress on the two vessels? And can you confirm to the committee that both that work on both vessels is currently ongoing? I, will do. I, I personally haven't visited the yard. Um, uh, my ministerial colleague, uh, Paul Wheelhouse, is. Uh, alongside uh, Derek Mackay, who are engaged with the uh, trade unions, um, the advice that we get on progress relating to the two vessels is through CMAL. They also have an independent uh, uh, appointed individual who uh, uh, undertakes evaluation of the progress that's been made with the vessels and the uh, work that's been progressed at that particular point. Uh, and that information is then fed back to ministers as well and giving them an update on the progress that's been made. And my second question was, can you confirm if work on both uh, hulls is taking place? Um, at this present moment, my understanding is that there is uh, work being undertaken on the Glen Sanox, uh, but I couldn't give you exact details on the 802. I don't know if Chris could give you details on that. Just to confirm the last figures we had from CMAL indicate that there are still people working on both vessels. Um, so the resource has been spread across both the so, so there's still work in terms of the last figures I've had from CMAL which are probably a couple of weeks out of date uh, there are people still working on, on both 801 and it, and is CMAL on site uh, monitoring progress or, or is the government just sending pe people periodically to so CMAL has a permanent presence on on site okay um, and can I ask um, about the potential impact of the cost on this I appreciate there's an independent arbitrator involved in identifying the cost overruns but we already know the cost overruns are in the tens of millions already, notwithstanding any future uh, additional cost to the, the, the build. Um, if it is found that there is liability on the part of CMAL for an overrun, given that this was a fixed cost design and build contract, it, it, is it your opinion then that, that f the, o those cost overruns will be met by the Scottish Government, that is to say, by the taxpayer? And in, why would it be in the form of loans to CMAL and how does that relate to the loans which have already been given to Ferguson? Is there any correlation between the two? You know, the, the loans that were given to Ferguson, one was in re relation to providing them with working capital uh, for it, and the other part of the loan was in relation to helping them as a, a business and to diversify and develop their business as mm -hmm. well. So that's the, the purpose of the loans which were provided um, on that occasion. 
Um, in relation to, um, uh, I'll ask Chris to cover the exact uh, process in terms of the CMAL funding and the, the loans arrangement, which would be necessary. Um, the independent um, uh, uh, reviewer has been appointed to look at the dispute between both FML and CMAL uh, to uh, give ministers an independent view uh, of uh, the dispute between both of them and to give us an evaluation of that uh, dispute. Uh, if there are uh, uh, if there are found to be liabilities in the part of uh, CMAL, uh, then that's a matter, as I mentioned to Mr Finney, that we would have to consider being, uh, uh, providing CMAL with funding for uh, in order to meet that. However, um, I don't want to get into speculating about the costs of that because the uh, process we've set in place is one which we uh, want to have undertaken uh, partially, independently, uh, and to give ministers an informed position so that we can then make a decision uh, relating uh, to uh, the findings from that independent uh, review. I'll ask uh, Chris just to mention in terms of the process of uh, any loans that had to be provided to, to, to CMAL. Yeah, so ju just, just on that point, it's a, a technical point. The way we fund the construction of vessels is through loans to CMAL that are then recovered through time through the, the charter agreement with the operator. So that's just the standard way we would, we would fund vessels. Uh, we would just have to revisit that, that funding. Uh, but I think I absolutely second the, the Cabinet Secretary's point about it being premature and, and keen to maintain the integrity of the, the work that's uh, ongoing. Sorry, can, I just, can I, sorry, Jamie, just no, jumping in, because I, I'm completely unclear. When those loans were first announced, the £47 million pounds that were lent to Ferguson Marine, we were told in the Parliament that they were to develop further business and allow the Ferguson Marine to expand. Are you now confirming that those were loans were working capital to allow them to build the ferries? Because the two statements don't tie up together. There are two separate loans that were provided to uh, if my one was in relation to developing the business, uh, and that was to diversify, uh, and the other element was to support them with working capital. So there were uh, two loans of £47 million. No. So there's a loan of uh, there's a loan of £15 million, pounds which was provided for the purpose of working capital. There was a loan of £30 million, pounds which was provided for the purpose of helping to develop and diversify the business. OK, thank you. Sorry, Jamie. So by default, then, that's an admission that the £97 million pound was never the fixed price, because if you've just said that you gave an additional loan to the, directly to the yard, not via the due process, which presumably would be via CMAL, why did you give the money to Ferguson, not to CMAL, to give the money to Ferguson? It seems like an, an anomaly in terms of how these no. things are funded. So, the, so the, the funding which has been provided for the two loans for the companies has come through a different route altogether. It was provided through... Um, uh, that's why it, it, the finance secretary is involved in it, because it was funding which was provided through agencies for the purpose of actually supporting the business, um, which was, for example, if it was, wasn't was doing ships or something else, yeah. right, it was about supporting that as a business and helping to support uh, shipbuilding in the Lower Clyde and helping to support them as a business. They had mm. uh, uh, financial, um, uh, uh, given the nature of the work they were getting into and developing sort of idea, they had uh, financial challenges around working capital, and that's why the loan was provided as well for them. And there's a measure in that for that money to be recovered to the taxpayer as well. Mm -hmm. So, because it is a loan. Uh, the loan, which is for CMAL, loans that are provided to CMAL, is a separate process altogether. That's the process that, uh, that's just been outlined to you, is how we fund the construction of ships, how we have funded them and how we have, how we continue to fund them through CMAL. Okay. And I think that really at the heart of this, what matters to folk is that the ferries are delivered. Um, they're clearly uh, uh, way over schedule. Um, uh, CalMAC, when they were previously before committee, uh, explained the extent to which that would put pressures on the existing fleet, uh, uh, given... Uh, that the current vessels and operation of those routes are, are ageing and, and on occasion do go off offline. Um, can you give us any indication, or give indeed uh, people living on our island communities any indication as to when they might expect these new ferries in operation? I mean, you must have a rough idea. Well, look, I, I completely agree with you in terms of where we are with these two vessels. Is certainly not uh, where any of us would want to be. Um, uh, we want to see these vessels actually being utilised um, uh, and, and on routes at the present time. Um, uh, as it stands at the present moment, the, uh, uh, their indications are that they expect uh, both vessels to be completed next year, um, uh, one in the earlier part of the year, or I think prior to the summer, and one later in the year, uh, which they're indicating. However, there are still some questions around their ability to keep to those timescales, which is why I mentioned to my response to John Finney that the Director of uh, uh, economic development has gone back to them seeking further details and uh, uh, assurances around the timeframes that they've set out. Jamie, I'm going to just 
bring him very briefly, Richard. Uh... Yes, I, I, I know why we, we went and saved uh, Ferguson Marine, and I don't want to get into that, but what I, what I do want to ask is we ordered two new ferries which are now delayed. The fleet's getting older, we know that. So what plans do you have to order future new ferries, or do you have any plans to order future new ferries? Because if the, the ones that are on order now are delayed, um, are, should we not be ordering other ferries just now? So the next ferry which was due for um, uh, replacement was the uh, ferry which operates on the Isla route. Um, uh, the uh, design and the, or the specification for that particular vessel is ongoing at the present time. So, uh, so that process is ongoing um, uh, uh, with a view to finalising the specification of that and then looking to put that out to procurement as well. So that's the next vessel which is planned. You may be aware that we're also undertaking the wider work we're doing around um, uh, the review of our ferries plan with a view to developing a new ferries plan. Uh, the present one goes on to 2022 uh, and we're undertaking a range of work and actually preparing for um, uh, for the next stage of uh, the ferries plan. But the uh, procurement pro or the process for uh, the next ferry to be replaced is ongoing at the present time. So that work hasn't come to a halt, just waiting for these two ferries to be completed. Okay, that's fine. Um, so uh, the uh, process, um, uh, we're scoping out some of the process at the present time. Um, uh, the, um, uh, there's some evaluation work uh, been undertaken already uh, on the uh, ferry services in Orkney, Shetland and the Western Hills. We're also carrying out a piece of research at the present time on RET uh, in order to feed that all into the process. Um, it's due to be discussed um, again at the Islands Transport Forum in August of this year, which is chaired by uh, the Islands Minister, Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, and we should then be in a position uh, in, the, uh, in the months ahead to set out what the time frame will be for, uh, for this uh, normal uh, public consultation exercise. But uh, what I would say to you is that a number of the stakeholders who have an interest in these matters at the present time are already engaged in the process and looking at some of the scoping work and some of the issues that need to be addressed in the next ferries plan anyway. Cabinet Secretary, um, just on a comment that you made earlier that both ferries were going to be delivered next year, could you please, could I ask you please to write to the committee and let them know dates because it seems odd to me and I, I'm struggling to understand how a ferry that was launched 18 months ago and is floating is going to be completed at the same time as a ferry that doesn't have bows or, or a stern on it at the moment. So uh, if it's truly at the same time, I am confused. I'm, I'm not sure that's what you meant. We haven't got time to probe further on it. Please could the, you write to the committee with the exact dates as soon as you know them when those ferries are going to be delivered. On that basis, I'm going to have to move on to the next question, which is uh, Peter Chapman. Peter. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, good morning. The AWPR, uh, now fully open and very welcome. Um, are there any snagging works ongoing, and if so, how long might these last and what impact might they have on the travelling public going forward? Um, well, I'm glad you're enjoying the benefits of the yeah. AWPR. Uh, and all the feedback I've had from uh, people who stay in the North East is that they very much welcome. Uh, uh, the, the the new road. Um, I, as you'd imagine, with any major piece of infrastructure, there's always snagging works uh, that are tidying up work that has to be completed afterwards, uh, after it's opened. Um, uh, that's the case on the AWPR, so I think there's some planting stuff that's still to take place, some mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 some bits of work around uh, 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 junctions with local roads, etc., that have to be uh, to have to be updated, but uh, my understanding is that that work will be carried out over the course of the summer months, mm. um, uh, and once that work's complete, that will be the, uh, the outstanding snagging and tidying up work complete. There has been uh, some criticism, and rightly so, I believe, on, on the, the signage on the road, not being particularly clear, not being particularly beneficial to, to drivers that are unaware of, uh, of the road. Is there any work ongoing? Is there anything being done to, to look at the signage and see what, how it could be made better? Well, look, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I missed your second part of your question in terms of delays uh, for the snagging work. Most of the snagging work won't involve any delays. Any, anywhere yeah. there is a need for a bit of a road closure, it will take place at night time and it will be 
uh, on a limited nature. Uh, so I wouldn't expect it to cause any particular difficulty for those using AWPR. Um, in relation to um, uh, in relation to uh, signage, uh, the process for any major road of this nature is that there's a there's a detailed audit is undertaken of the signage that's uh, put on the road before it opens, mm. uh, and that has to go through a, a standard process of it being checked and to make sure that it's compliant with the uh, the requirements for road signage um, of a road of this nature. That was carried out prior to the AWPR uh, opening, and uh, the signage is all compliant with what is actually meant to be uh, put in place. If there are some very specific issues uh, about particular areas of uh, signage that people get concerned about, always happy for uh, for uh, to ask for that to be uh, to be looked at. But the the process uh, that is set down for major roads of this nature, uh, that the signage went through the audit process, complied with that. Uh, and the appropriate signage is all in uh, place. But um, if there are uh, particular issues uh, that the member wants to draw to my attention, I'm more than happy to make sure that they are looked into. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. The AWPR contractors told this committee when they came before us on the 5th of December that they had lodged a claim against Transport Scotland for additional costs incurred in construction of the road primarily due to delays in the delivery of utility diversion works and extreme weather. Could you tell the committee what's happening about that claim and how that's being addressed? So the, um, uh, the claim is still outstanding. Um, uh, the most up-to-date information I have from officials is that, um, and as I've said in Parliament before and at this committee, it's down to the contractors to substantiate their claim. Mm. Uh, what they haven't been able to do as to date uh, is provide uh, a sufficiency of evidence to uh, to substantiate it. Uh, therefore, the onus is still with them uh, in order to uh, to demonstrate any additional costs and evidence to support that. Uh, and uh, uh, there's an ongoing dialogue between Transport Scotland officials and also with the AWPR uh, um, uh, companies uh, around this matter. But the uh, onus is still very much with the contractors to provide uh, that evidence, and to date they haven't done so. We are operating a little bit in the dark with this because nobody on the committee, for instance, knows what level of claim the contractors have put in. Um, I could understand it if it was a sort of um, commercial and confidence claim, whether, wh whether you're dealing with a contract that you're about to award, that's, that's perfectly fine. But this is work that's been completed, and I think certainly the public, and I, I think MSP would like to know, what what level of compensation are we talking about? I mean, I don't want the, the, the you know the old pound insurance and pen design, but I just want to know. I would like to know. I think it'd be helpful to know what level of of, of claim the the lodged against Transport Scotland. Well, look, these are commercially sensitive, but it, 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 the other thing that's important to keep in mind here is that the onus is on the contractors Indeed. to demonstrate yeah. um, any additional costs that they have incurred. So. Um, it, it's not for me to sit here and to accept any form of liability uh, without them uh, substantiating the evidence to support any such claim. What I am uh, prepared to do is to make sure that Parliament's kept up to date uh, should any final outcome be arrived at uh, in relation to their claim. Um, but I'm not going to get drawn into uh, uh, you know, providing figures um, if, um, if, the, if the, the companies who have lodged a claim choose to do so, that's a matter for them. Um, but it is a, a, a process that is normally dealt with in confidence uh, because of the commercial sensitivities relating to it, uh, uh, given the potential impact it could have in these companies mm -hmm. uh, in themselves. Um, but uh, the onus is very much in them okay. uh, to demonstrate liability and the evidence to support their claim. If I, if I could just follow that by saying, really, we were told this was a fixed-term contract. And a a fixed-price contract. <laughs> Yeah. Fixed price, yes. Yeah. Fixed, slip of the tongue. Fixed price contract, and uh, the layman would normally assume a fixed price contract is is just that. Um, it's a bit puzzling, therefore, what grounds they could have if if it is a fixed price contract, and the contract is being completed and delivered, and the price is being paid. I'm just trying to get a handle on on if it fixed price contract. Why would they be putting a claim in if, if it is a fi if is a, if it is actually a fixed price contract? 
Uh, that's really a question for them because it is a fixed price contract. So from the taxpayer's point of view, it protects the taxpayer uh, in that uh, this is uh, this is uh, the construction project you've been asked to undertake. Uh, this is a, a, and they come back with a cost and that's the fixed cost that's agreed on that. Um, it, it, the onus is on them to demonstrate any liability uh, that has uh, resulted in them in the, uh, uh, you know, drawing in additional costs. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the collapse of Carillion's had an impact on them um, uh, as one of the main contractors uh, who were part of the joint venture. Uh, weather events have had an impact on uh, mm -hmm. the, the timeline, which will have had an impact on them. Um, however, um, any additional costs uh, from a taxpayer have to be evidenced and demonstrated, and to date, they've not been able to do so. I think we need to have them back in that case, don't we, convener? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure the committee can, can, can consider that in, in due course. The next question is from John Finney. John. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, able to provide us updates on the A9 and A96 dueling projects, please? Um, the uh, A9 is the point where um, one section has been complete, um, uh, second section is under con uh, construction at the present time. Balfour Beatty uh, secured that contract last year. Um, uh, uh, progress has been made on it. Uh, we have of the remaining sections, 95% of the uh, orders uh, for the route have been issued. Um, uh, uh, some will potentially go to uh, public local inquiries, others won't. Um, uh, the one section which is out uh, remaining is the one at uh, the T uh, crossing area, which is uh, 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 past the Burnham, uh, which is a co-creative process, which is, takes longer uh, uh, to undertake. Um, uh, but we would expect the preferred route uh, on that particular section to be finalised by the end of this year, uh, which would then mean that all parts of the finalised route have uh, been agreed. So. Uh, progress has been made, um, uh, uh, good progress has been made, and it's at the point where we would expect it to be at this particular point. Are you a fan of the co-creative process, Cabinet Secretary? It appears to have been, uh, we want to evaluate it, um, uh, given this is the first time it's been utilised. Um, it's more time consuming, um, uh, it's a longer process, uh, but we want to learn from uh, the use that we've made of it um, in this particular section on A9 and to evaluate how it could possibly be used at some point again in the future. Um, uh, but there are clearly merits in it um, uh, and we want to understand how we can make more use of them. In relation to the A96, um, uh, if that would be helpful as well. well can, can I maybe just ask want to stick a to the A9? On the, on, on the co-creative process. Co -creative process <laughs> as I suspect you knew I might. I've yeah. uh, been assured of an evaluation of that for a long time. And there's great frustration, particularly in the A96, as you're possibly aware, that this level of engagement's not being afforded other communities. When will that evaluation be complete? And when can you roll it out to ensure there's maximum citizen involvement in these major capital projects? Well, as you'll be aware, that, that particular section hasn't been fully completed yet. So in terms of the whole process of the co-creative process is not at an end yet because the finalised route choice has not been made, uh, which will Time happen this year. That, Kevin, so Secretary. that's by the end of this year. That should be completed. We are uh, There's a consultation exercise being undertaken with the uh, route options that came from the co-creative process and also the other options that have been identified. Uh, that starts this month. Yes. Um, so um, in the next couple of weeks, uh, well, there's events for... Uh, members of the local public to come along and become involved in that and to feed into that process uh, uh, on the identified routes. So once we've completed the route selection process, we're then in a position to actually carry out an evaluation of the co-creative process and uh, uh, and what lessons can be learned from that, how it could be utilised at some point again in the future. Uh, uh, but it does add significant uh, uh, a significant amount of time uh, into the process in itself. Uh, so we want to make sure we learn from that uh, as part of the process. <coughs> OK, I wonder, perhaps prior to going to the A96, if I can draw your attention. The, the committee received an email from a member of the public, uh, and, and it was regarding the A96. The member of the public's um, concerns were, and I'll summarise them here, the project of the A96 has been pursued in isolation from wider transport developments in Murray. There's limited cooperation between Transport Scotland and Murray Council on tackling key transport problems in towns such as Elgin and Lossiemouth. The public transport benefits of the project are overstated. They also going to say that the A96 is a, 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 a series of local roads rather than a, used primarily for that rather than N10 journeys, and that fuel dueling of the A96 was rejected by a wide range of community organisations. I wonder, prior, when you give an update, if you could say 
whether you believe that the co-creative process being applied across the A96 would have addressed some of that, uh, these concerns, and can you comment on these concerns that basically this is a major product in isolation to other matters? Well, the co-creative co process is looking at the particular route options uh, and engaging the community in that particular process, and uh, that's how it was utilised on this particular occasion. In relation to the A96, um, there has been a rolling programme of engagement over an extended period of time uh, in A96. So far, there's been 5,700 people participating in the process, attending events uh, which have been organised uh, in order to uh, look at the whole issue of uh, drilling of the A96 that have been undertaken by Transport Scotland uh, and their uh, colleagues, which has resulted in a significant amount of feedback from local communities on this whole uh, process. I recognise that undertaking any major infrastructure project of that nature, that there will be those who are not happy uh, with it possibly taking place in the first place, uh, those who are not happy with the decisions that are made around which routes are in, which routes are out, uh, and then which route is finally chosen. Um, I recognise that. But I, I would strongly dispute any suggestion that there has not been an opportunity for communities to be fully involved in this process and to feed their views into it. And the figures that I've just offered you in terms of the number of people who have attended events that have been organised in relation to uh, the process around the A96, I think demonstrate the level of uh, public input that we've had so far to that process. Can and you, that can you evidence that that public input um, is reflected in any decision making? Because, of course, a significant percentage of the public who do engage feel that it's academic because this big juggernaut of government is going to do what they're going to do anyway. Well, we can evidence it in what's going to be undertaken just in the next couple of weeks, where part of the public engagement programme, um, uh, uh, which is going to be undertaken, is going to very specifically not just look at the routes which remain uh, 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 as a choice of route, uh, but also to give details on the routes which have been excluded and why they've been excluded, so that uh, those who are disputing uh, that some routes, some want particular online routes uh, taken forward, setting out the details as to why they have been excluded as well. So it's not just a case of just pushing on uh, with the routes that it's now down to, it's also about explaining the routes that have been removed from the process. So there's an opportunity to, for the public to understand that and to feed back into that process and to make the responses known as well. Okay, thank you very John, much. John, I am uh, yes, afraid yeah. going to have to bring in some other members who want to ask on this subject. So the first one is Peter Chapman. Thanks, Convener. I mean, uh, on the A96, uh, Government Secretary, there is great concern about the, the routes that have, have been uh, are still on the table as far as going around and uh, the bypass in Inverurie is concerned. And, uh, you know, I met with a group just uh, the other week, a very professional and, and, and they had a very well argued case that dueling the existing uh, route was far and away the best option. And I challenge, I, I, have, I have asked, I don't know if you're aware, but I have asked for a meeting with yourself uh, as soon as possible to discuss this. And I would, I would invite you to uh, allow these people to come and speak to you because I think they're very professional people. They have a very well argued case and I think it needs to be heard. And, and this is in particular about the, the Inverurie bypass section of the, of the A96. Look, I've already had engagement around that, this very specific issue. I've actually also answered questions in the Chamber on this matter just in the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, and uh, part of the public consultation process that has been undertaken, uh, I think it starts in the next couple of weeks, next couple of weeks. Uh, uh, it sets out, uh, will set out the very clear reasons as to why the online route that you referred to has been excluded. A very key part of that is because of the space that's available to create the carriageways the number of houses that would actually have to uh, be, uh, which would have to be demolished, uh, gardens that would have to be removed uh, from those who live right adjacent to the road as well, not to create the carriageway size that's necessary and the embankments which are necessary. There are very good practical reasons as to why that route has been uh, uh, ruled out. Uh, and those who are involved in this campaign will have an opportunity to feed into that public consultation process um, in the next couple of weeks, which will explain this in detail. So, uh, so there is a process for these individuals to engage in that, and I would encourage them to uh, to do so uh, alongside those who are in favour of other routes. That's not the online uh, join to allow mm. them to express their views as well, uh, and the uh, and the, the process that we have in place is one which is robust, thorough, and detailed, and one which is also fair and allows people to express their opinions. Uh, Mr. Chapman, 
and I'm going to have to ask you to try and uh, take that up with the Cabinet Secretary mm -hmm. at a later time because of the, uh, the shortness of the yeah. time. Maureen, you wanted to come in briefly. Uh, convener, <clears throat> I mean, Cabinet Secretary, can you confirm that it is still is the government's intention to make sure that all our cities are uh, connected by dual carriageways? And in relation to parts of the A96, is it not the case that there's the kind of the equivalent of nimbyism in relation to roads, that I've got the dual carriageway as far as my place, um, and really it doesn't need to go any further, and it's important that we get on with this work, uh, regardless of our number of landlords around in Veruri who don't think it should go any further? Can we uh, understand... There's obviously a difference of opinion here. Could I ask you to give a very short answer to that, uh, Cabinet so, um, uh, the, <laughs> the, the dueling of the A96 is a major part of our transport infrastructure and uh, helping to improve the local economy as well, given the economic benefits that come from better connectivity. Uh, but there's a very robust, thorough process there uh, to consider all the routes. I'm very conscious that when you're upgrading or putting in a major piece of infrastructure of this nature, there'll be those who will not be in favour of particular routes and those who are not in favour of it at all and those who are in favour of particular routes and are in favour of the development. Um, but it's a thorough process that will consider all of the issues as it has been doing and those who have opinions in it have an opportunity to use the consultation process like any other member of the public to express their views. Hey. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The next question is on the Queen's Ferry crossing. Uh, you used uh, referred to a definition, I think, in a question that uh, Peter used uh, about snagging. Can I just confirm that uh, your definition of snagging is the same as mine, which is minor defects or omissions in building works for a contractor to rectify after the completion of the project? By and large. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So there were 23 on the list that was submitted to the committee. Uh, I believe, earlier this year. Could you just say whether those are all going to be completed by October of this year? So the uh, contractors are still working to that timetable. So, for example, uh, painting of the uh, cable guide pipes uh, is now complete. The snagging on the windshield is complete. The tour lifts, uh, where there has been an issue in terms of the construction of them, there was a... Uh, uh, well, uh, we'll come to tower lifts. An omission from the contract is hardly snagging. So if we, if we could well, leave... Uh, if the we could leave them and come back to them, second part of my question, okay, the rest well, of them. So, uh, but anyway, the, the lifts are presently being manufactured, given the previous technical issues. The under deck painting, painting is now underway. Architectural lighting is now operational. Uh, and commissioning of internal mechanical and electrical equipment is progressing well. Uh, and the contractor is continuing to make good progress uh, uh, with the mobilisation of the workforce, which was a challenge for them around some of the issues and work that had to be undertaken, uh, and is still working to uh, complete it in timetable uh, this year. So October this year? Uh, that's the timetable they're working to. Okay. Of course, as you will appreciate, there are some pieces of work which are weather sensitive that could have an impact on the completion of that work. For example, some aspects of the painting work uh, is weather sensitive. So. Um, uh, if, they, um, uh, if they get the weather uh, that allows them to complete it all uh, by October, they'll be in that position. But there is always a potential for delays if weather has an impact. OK. Cabinet Secretary, going back to the comment that you made earlier about the lifts, if we could look at those specifically. The lifts weren't put in. That seems to me, when the bridge was opened, it could not be classed as snagging. It, it seems if, if a major part of the contract wasn't actually built, that was more than snagging. Would you agree with me? Um, well, you, you understand the reasons why the lifts weren't installed. Uh, well, uh, I can understand that there would always be a reason for something, but w what we were told, there was just minor snagging when the contract was completed, but actually the omission of one of the main parts of the contract, i.e. there were no lifts. It's rather like saying that a house is, is completed apart from minor snagging, but there's no staircases. It would be difficult to live in a house without a staircase if you had to live upstairs. Uh, the difference is that you can use the bridge uh, without having the lifts in place. So you so still lift, believe so they so were the, minor snagging? So the, bridge, so the bridge is perfectly safe and able to be used without the lifts being in place. Well, it's a bit different from a staircase in a house. OK, so the, the next issue that I've got on the bridge, which was highlighted earlier in the year, were cars that were being damaged by ice that was dropping off the cables. Uh, and it was reported that, that cars were... Uh, uh, hit by ice and, and there was significant damage. Could you explain to me how you're resolving that? So my understanding is that, that some contractors have been appointed to monitor this particular issue to identify 
uh, the exact source of it and to then look at what mitigation may have to be put in place if that is the case. Okay, but on other cable bridges such as such as Queen's Ferry Crossing where, the, where it is cold, they, they have identified this problem before. Should this not have been something that we should have foreseen on, on the Queen's Ferry Crossing? Can't comment on other bridges, but in relation to this bridge, it's not something that was anticipated and that's why the contractors are looking at trying to identify the exact source of it and what appropriate measures could be undertaken to try and address the issue. So... <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's of concern that, that last winter wasn't a particularly cold winter, uh, and we have had colder winters in 2010 and 2011, where the problem could have been significantly greater, which would have resulted in the bridge being closed. Um, do you foresee that this is uh, something that could happen in the future? Well, that's why the contractors are looking to identify what exactly the source is and to look at what measures can put in place. Clearly, if there's an issue... Uh, where uh, there is ice gathering in particular points uh, on the actual uh, bridge frame, then it may be that they have to take measures in order to address that. OK, so can I ask when those contractors would be due to report? Uh, I think part of the challenge is around uh, the time when they can actually identify where the ice is exactly forming. So, uh, But they, uh, they've got work in place just now to try and identify where they believe it may be occurring uh, and to look at what measures can be put in place. But I can't give you a timeline specifically as to when that matter will be resolved. But I'm more than happy to keep the committee up to date uh, as to when it has been identified and what measures have been undertaken. I mean, it would be ser of serious concern if we had to wait for more ice to form before they could identify where the problem is. You're not suggesting that's the issue, is it? No, I'm not. I'm just saying that it, it may take them uh, a bit of time in order to identify exactly where the main areas of risk are and what appropriate measures can be put in place. But and they're, already, they're already taking forward work in order to try and identify that. Uh, and I'm more than happy to keep the, the committee informed of progress. And can you just confirm to me when you believe the lifts will be completed? Uh, it, well, the work is all due to be completed this year uh, and they're under manufacture at the present time. Uh, so, and the uh, most up-to-date information we have from the contractors is that they expect it to be completed this year. OK. I, I have to say, and I, I, I'm going to move on to the next question, that actually the admission of, a, of lifts to me seems more than the minor snagging, which is what we were told was outstanding. And, and it's certainly, you know... <laughs> I, I think it's fundamentally difficult and would be difficult to identify the ice if people can't get up to the top of the bridge to see where it's forming. But so be it. Uh, Colin, yours is the next question. Thank you very much, convener, and uh, good morning to the Cabinet Secretary. Can I turn to the issue of, of rail and, uh, and an update on the uh, implementation of the first of the, the, the two Scott Rail uh, remedial plans on performance? The, the remedial plan itself was called for to improve performance, but the agreement doesn't um, actually introduce any new performance requirements. So what would happen in the event of the plan being implemented in full, but performance was still below breach uh, as it currently is? Would, would that constitute uh, an event of default? It, as I told the committee previously, yes, it would. So, if there was no, so can I just clarify what the performance requirements are within the remedial agreement? So the, the purpose of the remedial agreement is to get them out of the position of breach. breach okay. if, they don't implement the, uh, if they don't implement the remedial plan effectively and they remain in breach, they then fall into default. Okay. Okay. So, so the plan runs uh, until 2020. Uh, at what, pla what, at what point during that time do we actually have to see improved performance? I mean, if, if performance continues to fall and it continues to be clear that it won't rise above breach level by the end of the plan, when will you intervene? What action will you take? Or will you just wait till the, the end do, of the, do the plan? Do you mean agreement? in relation to the, the areas of breach that the remedial plan is to address? Yeah, or, or that, we That's don't, what the remedial yeah. plan's for. Yeah, the remedial plan's to, to improve performance, but if it becomes... I mean, this plan is, is set to run until 2020, but if it becomes clear during the course of that plan that performance is not improving, that it continues to be below breach level, which is currently below breach level, what action will you take? Will you simply wait till the end of the plan to see if, if we are above breach level, or, or will you intervene earlier if, if it's clear that performance is not improving? Well, for example... Um, uh, one of the aspects that is set out within the remedial plan is to complete the training of crew uh, by the end of this month. Um, uh, the most up-to-date information we have from Scott Reel is that uh, they're on track with that. Uh, that will have an immediate impact on passenger services. So, for example, those services which have been 
uh, cancelled as a result of a lack of train crew due to train crew training uh, uh, will no longer take place. Uh, and that was a specific problem on the, the eastern part of the, uh, the network. So we'll see improvements as a result of that. In fact, over the course of the last uh, three weeks, we have saw uh, improvements taking place. So the levels of cancellations which have occurred as a result of uh, train crew training uh, has been reducing week on week as they complete the training uh, programme. So there's a practical example of the benefits that will come from the implementation of the remedial plan. So I wouldn't expect no improvements to occur, uh, given that they've already started to occur as a result of implementation uh, of that. Uh, but the breach is very specific uh, to, the, uh, to the breaches in the east sector uh, as a result of cancellations due to a lack of train crew. Uh, and its specific purpose is to get them out of that position. Uh, and the progress that we've saw in the last couple of weeks would indicate that we're already starting to see some signs of that. And, and you corrected that the breach is very much around the east of the region. But just on a general point, um, when you last came to committee, you indicated that you believe, because at this moment in time, ScotRail should be hitting a performance target of 92.5 as part of the breach. And when you were at the last committee meeting, you indicated that you believe that that would, that would be reached by March 2021. Do you still stand by that? Um, they're still, that's still their uh, uh, target that they have set. Uh, and is that your belief that, to, is that your belief that they'll hit that target? To, um, I want to see them reach that target, uh, and we're continuing to press them but, but do you think uh, they'll to hit make that? sure that they do, do you think that, they'll hit that target, Do you think they'll hit that target? Um, I think there is, um, uh, if they, uh, with the, once all the, uh, the rolling stocks in place uh, and they have their train crewing issues resolved, and if we see uh, greater uh, resilience within the infrastructure, yes, they can. But while you still have 65% of all cancellations and delays as a result of infrastructure issues, that will inevitably have an impact on their ability to reach that target. So as I've said many times, we need to see both parts of the railway playing their part in order to make sure passengers get the best service they can and that they can reach that target. Um, if, that, uh, if that happens, if both parts play their part in delivering more consistent, reliable service. But, but the remedial plan itself doesn't say that they'll reach that target on that date. There's a, there's a different one that says performance will still be below 90% at that point, whereas the Donovan, Donovan Review says that they'll reach that the re target. The remedial plan is not to get them to that point. The remedial plan is to get them out of breach. Oh, but the projections within the remedial plan, to be fair, do say that you won't reach that target <laughs> across Scotland at 92.5. I'm just wondering why there's a difference. Because the do I explained this the last time because there's a difference between what's in the remedial plan and what was in the Donovan review. The uh, work that needs to be undertaken in the Donovan review is going to take a longer period of time in order to be implemented, which is why the target within the Donovan review is a different one. Mm. I'm going to have to move on, but just just clar I, I, I'm unclear. You, you said there was it was possible they could reach the target, but the question you asked was, would they? Do you think they would? Do you think? So that's a yes or no answer. Um, I think um, uh, I think uh, I think they can, uh, and they will if all parts of the rail network plays its part, including network rail, to make sure we get greater consistency on the network, I'll particularly take that as in a yes. infrastructure. Richard, yours is the yeah, next that, question. That's the point. That's the point I've been labouring for months upon months upon months. Scott Rail, to me, is doing a good job. I was in a train a couple of weeks ago, on time, didn't skip stop, excellent conductor, you know, so yes, they have pro problems, but the major problem is the fact that we do not control network rail. And network rail, if a signal is down or uh, there are problems, there are 950 trains going to Glasgow Central every day, 950. So if a, if a signal's down or network rail, something's wrong there, you know, so what are we doing to get control of network rail? Or do you think we'll never get control of network rail? Well, the, the Wilkins review has taken place at the present moment. Our view is very clear about the need for the Scottish network to be uh, in control here in Scotland so that decisions around timetabling, all of infrastructure matters are decided here, not in Milton Keynes, uh, uh, as it stands at the present moment. Um, uh, and what I, I will repeatedly say uh, and I know that, uh, including the convener, uh, hasn't liked us in the chamber, is that the reality is that network rail play a key part 
in delivering reliability on our railways. Not just Scott Rail or Bell Rail franchise, but Network Rail. If we look at today's performance alone, the impact that Network Rail failures have actually had on Scott Rail's performance have been very, very marked. Signalling failures, points failures, signalling failure, and I think it was stuff in the line, uh, Debbie in the line, we had a major uh, signalling failure at Busby yesterday, uh, which occurred, which went on for hours, that had a major impact on what had been a very good day's performance that all of a sudden just dropped right off as a result of it. Now, those who want to just point the finger at Scott Rail and Abellio and at the Scottish Government miss the point. They miss the point that both parts have got their part to play. Uh, we can do everything we can to make sure that the rolling stock is upgraded, which we're doing through the new Hadachi trains, with the new high-speed uh, refurbished trains coming online, which are delayed again uh, as a result of uh, Wabtec. But when 65% of your delays and cancellations are due to infrastructure failures, then we can't ignore that, because it's a direct impact and bearing on the experience that passengers have. That's why the ORR have also recognised that Network Rail's performance is not good enough and why they've issued them with notice in order to address that. So if we are serious about it and about delivering better services for the public, as I've repeatedly said, we need to see both parts of the railway system playing their part. So and we will do everything we can to make sure Scott Rail are playing their part, but we need Network Rail to also deliver. So if you're pressed today to make promises that they're going to meet this, that or the other, you know, it all depends on Network Rail, doesn't it? Well, yes, if, yes if, or no? A major part, yes, yes. which I don't control. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll move on to my next question. As I say, I think I proved my point in regard to Network Rail and how Scott, Scott Rail are, are uh, uh, saddled with Network Rail. Uh, Abelio was issued with a second remedial plan notice by Transport Scotland on 8th of February 2019 for failing to meet customer satisfaction targets set out in the franchise agreement. So can you provide an update uh, or, a, or again um, on the development of a second remedial plan action by Abellio and this time dealing with improvements to customer service? So we've received the uh, draft remedial pra plan from uh, Scott Rail, uh, which arrived on the 3rd of May, uh, which is presently being evaluated uh, and assessed in the same way we did with the initial uh, the first of the remedial plans. That work is ongoing at the present time. Um, it will then look to having that embedded within the contract uh, as a contract requirement for them. Uh, and it will also have a published version of what's contained within that remedial plan to address areas of deficiency that uh, it's meant to address. Some of the things that are actually, is it include car parks and litter and, you know, the state of uh, the outside of the, the station? You know, and sometimes even these car parks are not even near the station. Do we really, do, they, do we really assess Scott Rail on what how a, 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 a car park looks? I, I'm, I'm just concerned, Richard. I don't mean to cut you off and fill through, but we have lots of questions. Yeah. And trying to get well, other in. people have asked questions. I'm asking my questions. M Mr. Lyle, please. Could I ask you to answer that question briefly so we can move on to the other questions so all the committee get a chance to get in, please? Yes, um, the remedial plan um, relates to the National Rail Passenger Satisfaction Survey, and it's a wide scope of areas that are surveyed um, by uh, Transport Focus, uh, and that is station facilities, including car parks. Separate to that, we also obviously audit uh, Scott Rail through the Squire system for um, car parking, etc. Thank you. Jamie Green, you've got a brief follow-up, then followed by Mike Rumbles. Yes, yeah, very brief. Um, um, Cameron Secretary, you'll be aware that this week is um, Mental Health Awareness Week, and Scott Rail recently announced that we're going to train 50 of their staff on mental health first aid. I think that's something to be welcomed. Are you aware of any other uh, publicly funded or subsidised travel operators across your portfolio who are looking to do the same? Um, at the present time, no, I'm not. Is that something you would perhaps uh, press upon them to think about? I, I would certainly want to encourage them to do so. Um, uh, uh, but uh, um, uh, and the work that Scott Rail are intending to undertake, I think, is a positive one. Um, and it sends out a very strong message. Um, uh, and I'd like to uh, encourage them to look at extending it beyond the 50 that they're initially setting out to train them uh, uh, on mental health first aid skills. Thank you. Um, OK, thank you. Um, Mike. Thanks, Convener. Cabinet uh, Secretary, I'd like to move to cycling. Uh, if I may. Um, the Cycling Action Plan for Scotland said that 10% of every journey's 
to be made by bike by next year. Uh, and the latest figures we have is that journeys to work have risen from 2.3% to 3%. Uh, but obviously there's a wide variation in that. Mm. And I wondered, obviously, that target isn't going to be met. Um, but I mean, the whole point about targets is that you want to work towards them. So it's, it's practical issues about how we do this. And I know Parliament uh, suggested an amendment in Parliament last year which said that we should be giving uh, school children access to cycling proficiency. And mm. But the latest figures there show that most children don't have access to that. So how do you think you can, as Cabinet Secretary for Transport, really make a difference to try and get this target to 10% in practical terms rather than just setting a target? I think that's what we want to do. Mm. Look, I, uh, I agree with you in terms of uh, being able to achieve this target uh, within the time frame that we now have uh, for it being achieved is going to be extremely uh, difficult uh, to be able to do. Uh, I think you're right in saying we have saw variations. So, for example, in places like Edinburgh, uh, we see that uh, uh, the number of, uh, number of residents that are cycling uh, to travel to work has increased to 9.8%. Mm -hmm. So there's been a marked increase there. Um, uh, but the average as it stands is around 4%. Uh, so we are well off the target where we want to be. A uh, number of key things that I think are important here. Um, there's no doubt in my mind cycling infrastructure is an important element mm -hmm. of helping to encourage and support people to be able to cycle and to choose to cycle, particularly um, uh, uh, parents trying to encourage their children uh, to cycle. So the uh, doubling of our active travel uh, budget uh, to £80 million a year, which keep in mind is £80 million from the Scottish Government is match funded by the local authorities. So in any given year, we could have up to £135 million being invested in cycling infrastructure. That's a key part of um, helping to support people to take an active travel option such as cycling. We can see in some of our cities, for example, I recently visited the south side of Glasgow, where we can see the major cycleway they're putting in there, uh, and their plans to have several other uh, other major cycle routes to, uh, throughout the city to make cycling easier, which has been supported through our, uh, through our active travel budget and uh, funding from Glasgow City Council. So that's a key part. Infrastructure is an important element. A second important element is proficiency around it. So you're right, there are some local authorities are more proactive in supporting cycling proficiency than others. Um, and I would like to see a more consistent approach to uh, cycling proficiency being taught at schools uh, so that young people have confidence in being able to cycle uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, the, the proper, have the road sense uh, that's necessary in cycling um, uh, as well. Uh, one of the things that um, I want to take away from where we are with this particular target is to look at um, how can we how can we better achieve an increase in cycling uh, uh, that um, sees more people confident in being able to choose to cycle to work um, over and above what we're doing at the present moment? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a piece of work that we are presently looking to undertake. Could, could, I, could I ask, I mean, I understand entirely about infrastructure and it has to be there and that's obviously your focus to try and achieve that and a lot of strides have been made. But Parliament is an agreement, the Scottish Government is an agreement that actually and uh, you've just repeated it, that we've got to get our kids into that way of cycling. Um, and what we're talking about really is joined up government. I mean, I know your focus, as I say, on the infrastructure, but obviously um, the Cabinet Secretary for Education is focused on schools. Mm. Have you had discussions with him about trying to get uh, our schools to uptake really lift um, cycling proficiency in our schools because it's about joined up government is it not so it's joined up government it's not just about education it's also about sport Indeed. physical activity as well uh, so there's a health element to it uh, that we should recognize so there's a uh, there's a number of portfolios that have an interest in this uh, matter and we have had some initial discussions around how mm. we can try to address these issues particularly on the health side and the sports side but would you take it up as a catalyst so I'm, I'm i'm more than happy I, i've already identified as an area where i think we need to do more the £80 million pounds we provide a year, uh, the, the, about two-thirds of that is capital investment. The rest of it is revenue funding. So we support a range of other mm -hmm. uh, uh, organisations and initiatives to support walking and cycling as well. Uh, so, for example, just up from my own constituency office, we have the Active Travel Hub, uh, which is there, uh, which is funded through this particular scheme uh, to help to support people in getting information and advice and if they're looking to take up an active travel option, which has proven very popular. So um, uh, there is clearly more we need to do. I accept that. Uh, and I also accept your challenge that it needs to be taken up on a cross-portfolio basis. 
thank you, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I was, I was trying to catch your eye, uh, but sorry, you did, you did draw it to a close, and 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 I would have liked to bring it, bring in John Finney because I know he's got a question, but I'm sorry, I'm so pushed for time. So I'm going to ask John Mason to to ask his question that you'd like to ask, but could I ask you to do it very succinctly because I would like to get a small bit in on uh, the R100, John. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, can you give us an update on the National Transport Strategy and the Strategic Transport Projects Review, and will Glasgow Metro be part of that? So, uh, the uh, 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 NTS process um, uh, is ongoing. Uh, the uh, consultation process, uh, public consultation process, will start in the summer, uh, uh, which will allow people to feed into that. We've had engagement with stakeholders um, uh, and a range of other uh, interested parties up until now, but it will be more extensive uh, over the course of the summer months, which will then allow us to look at finalising the NTS by the end of this year. Uh, part of that uh, will then allow us to then have in, uh, the STPR2 uh, process. Uh, we have already started to, uh, some of the work around uh, STPR2. So, for example, the Borders uh, Transport Corridor Study, the work we're doing in the south uh, west of Scotland, uh, stuff that's been done in Argyll as well, are all the pre appraisal work that's necessary to feed into the STPR2 process. Uh, we are just in the, we've just completed or in the process of setting up the regional transport uh, working groups in different areas, which have bring together different stakeholders within different regions to feed into that process, to identify the issues, transport issues, and to feed into uh, the STPR2 process, uh, which will be completed in this uh, lifetime of this parliament. So uh, that work is ongoing and, uh, uh, and the consultation in the summer allows people to feed into the NTS process exactly, uh, specifically, and then the STPR process is uh, moving forward as well. And Glasgow might not be forgotten about. No, Glasgow won't be forgotten about, Falkirk won't be forgotten about, Paisley won't be forgotten about, Lanarkshire won't be forgotten about, the Highlands won't be forgotten about, the North East won't be forgotten about, because it is a national uh, process, so all parts of the country will be taken into due consideration, Mr Mason. Okay. So, so I'm sure somebody will scrutinise the official record to find out who you did leave who, out missed it. on that. The but islands <laughs> will be included as well. <laughs> so, ca ca Cabinet Secretary, can I just say at this stage there are other questions and some very important questions on climate change which we unfortunately aren't going to get to but the clerks will write to you with some of the questions that, that the members have on climate change because it is a, a very important subject and but we are going to move on to the uh, R100 program and I would like to welcome Robbie McGee uh, who has now joined uh, the panel and I'm going to ask Gail Ross to ask the first question Gail. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Cabinet Secretary, could you or your officials um, provide the committee with an update on the completion of the R100 tendering process at the um, Convener's group last week? The First Minister um, implied that it would be later this year. So, um, well, the First Minister is correct, it will be later this year that the procurement process will be complete. Um, the dialogue process is being complete. The uh, uh, companies who are involved in the procurement process are working up their uh, bids. They are due to be submitted uh, by the summer, um, yep. around the summer of uh, this year, uh, which will then allow them to be evaluated, which will then allow us to look at appointing a preferred bidder uh, later in the year. And without um, prejudice in that process at all, can you give us any insight into the delay? Uh, there's been a couple of factors for the delay. So um, uh, uh, there was um, uh, early on in the process, there was um, one of the uh, bidders at that point uh, uh, raised a complaint uh, under the code of conduct about one of the other bidders breaching the code of conduct, uh, which then had to be investigated, uh, which caused a delay in the process. We then had, the, uh, as we took forward, the gain share process that we had from the uh, DSSB programme. Uh, there were a number of areas that were identified where additional, uh, uh, additional uh, investment could be put into. Uh, what then happened was that the commercial market then identified areas that it matched into some of the areas that we were planning to go into. Uh, the UK government uh, then changed their position slightly around uh, how some of their funding could be used around the gain share element as well, uh, which then meant that properties that were in uh, had to come back out. 
uh, which then again, we then to allow the companies time to then take that back into their modelling process. So there have been a couple of elements that have had an impact on it. Uh, what we're keen here, but the very core of all of us, is about getting the best possible deal uh, for, uh, for delivering uh, super fast broadband that we can. This is the only project of its type in the UK of this size. It's a complex project. Uh, therefore, it's resulted in some real challenges for the industry. Uh, they've had to look at some of the real um, uh, geographical challenges which they will face, including the civil engineering challenges which will go with that. Uh, and as a result, they have asked for a bit of extra time in order to undertake these evaluations more fully. Uh, so rather than push them to the point of uh, push them to the point of them disengaging in the process, we have sought to give them the additional time in order to allow them to go through it more thoroughly uh, and to keep them engaged in the procurement process. And to date, that's been effective, and that's why we've given them additional time and why the process is slightly behind the original time frame. Um, can I just make a really quick request that you, if you're able to, write to the committee to tell us what the gain share has been at the end of the process? I'm more than happy to do that. Thank yes. you. Cabinet Secretary, can I just clarify? Uh, we, we were expecting the contracts to be awarded and agreed in February. Then they were delayed till May. Then they were, the announcement was that it would be made in the summer. And now we're later in the year. So that's obviously past the summer. When, when, could, could you try and give me... I'm just trying to understand a, 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 a specific period when we think the contract will be announced and, and be made public. Who's got it? Um, we would expect it to be in the autumn, um, in the later part of this year. So um, uh, once the process has been completed, then we are then in a position to look at awarding a preferred bidder. So, Cabinet Secretary, you know my problem with seasons. They, they, they stretch for three months. Could you, could you give me some clarity whether it would be the end of autumn? And you, you understand my reluctance to always give you specific time scales when well, there are we've, issues we've which are out to with get my control. So, autumn is uh, the closest we'll get. But it is going to be autumn, and we would expect it to be uh, around the sort of September, October period. That's the timeline we're on just now with the contractors. Okay. But I need to emphasise... We are trying to give them the additional time they need in order to undertake the procurement process as thoroughly as possible in order to get the best possible deal as part of this procurement okay. process. Peter, I'm going to let you ask one mm. brief question and then I'm afraid we're, we are closing on time. Well, uh, you know, we're, the, the timescale is obviously slipping. Um, the, even prior to these delays, Audit Scotland said that it will be difficult to deliver the 100% uh, superfast broadband by... 2021. Uh, I mean, it's pretty obvious that the uh, timescale isn't going to be agreed. And the other thing I would like to clarify, by 2021, to me, means by the end of 2020, or does that, is that what you believe? No. No. You believe that that's by the end of that 2021? Would be, that, would be the end, that would be by 2020. Yeah. Well, 2021 is, is the year 2021. Okay. So, uh, sorry, so I can... I can gonna, uh, is there any Peter, chance sorry, we, can, just we, can, we can do that? Peter, just to add clarity, I, the First Minister, when I asked that question, made it clear that, that it, the timescale that, that the government was working to was by 2021, which she intimated would be May time, i.e. the election. That's what she said at the thing. Peter, right. sorry. Okay, so, I mean, when can we uh, realistically expect the, the, this uh, R100 to be complete? So, basically, that's the question. Yeah, I, I think the member raised a, a reasonable point, as was highlighted by the Audit Scotland report, is, it, is a, it's a challenging timescale. Um, it's a difficult timescale uh, in which for us to achieve. Uh, uh, and given the nature and the complexity of the, the contract and the civil engineering that will be involved in some of the rural areas, it presents challenges for the contractor. We have a more accurate picture once we've actually got the final tenders uh, uh, from the companies, uh, which will then give us a clearer outline of the timeframes that they believe they can achieve it within. What we aren't doing is that, given the nature of the R100 programme, is that we're not working to the UK government's target for full fibre, which is 2033 uh, to all premises in the UK. Because if we waited that long, it'd be far too long which is why we have stepped in in an area that's wholly reserved to the UK government in order to make sure we've got the right digital connectivity in Scotland. And that's why the R100 programme is so important 
to our rural communities and also to our economy in making sure we've got the right type of digital connectivity in the country. But we're certainly not waiting for the timeline that's been set out by the UK government of 2033. Uh, and that's why this is a very ambitious programme. Um, and Cabinet Secretary, I thank you for that. We are um, unfortunately out of time. Um, but I'd like to thank you and, and the officials that you, you brought with you to give evidence. I would normally suspend the meeting, but because the meeting is, is pushed, I would like to move straight on to agenda item three and ask you, Cabinet Secretary, if you, you and your officials could leave quietly. I, I'd appreciate that. So, moving on to agenda item three, which is the annual report. Uh, you have, as a committee, received the um, annual report in your papers uh, and we are struggling for time, and therefore I don't think the, um, there's any reason why the committee shouldn't consider uh, agreeing the report by email uh, if the committee was minded to do that. But if, if the committee wants to make any general comments on it, I could take a brief general comment, or if the committee is happy to take, deal with it by email, um, I'd be happy to promote that as well. Does anyone have a reason why we shouldn't do it by email? So are we agreed as a committee to, to approve the report by email? We are agreed. Therefore, what I would like to do is uh, suspend the meeting and move the committee now to committee room one for a video conference with uh, the Right Honourable Michael Gove, which will start at 10.45. So if I could ask the committee to move there, I'd be very grateful. Thank you. And I now suspend the meeting.